on World News Tonight. Conflict continues. Marking one month since the beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the onslaught continues to intensify. However, Ukraine is holding down the fort as the Ukrainian government continues to stand. Sanctions galore. Europe and the United States gather for talks on how to overcome energy dependency on Russia, but Russia is turning the tables with new demands on transactions. Tornado troubles. Orlando is the latest in a slew of regions to fall victim to the increasingly lethal twisters traveling across America and the rest of the world. The damage being done leaves victims with no way out. And costumed fun. Saudis dress up as their favorite characters and parade Riyadh in a celebration of the season. is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with some more updates on the Ukraine crisis. It's been exactly a month since Russia started its current invasion of Ukraine. Estimates say that up to 15,000 Russian soldiers and at least 977 Ukrainian civilians could have been killed. Western countries are getting ready to apply more sanctions to pressure Russia to end the war. But Moscow is retaliating by only switching certain gas sales to the Russian ruble. A month into the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, NATO estimates between 7,000 and 15,000 Russian soldiers to have been killed in the last four weeks. As for Ukraine, an estimate by the UN says 977 civilians have been killed and almost 1,600 have been injured. About 10 million people, a quarter of the Ukrainian population, have been displaced. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said on Wednesday that Russian attacks have been deliberately targeting civilians. He defined the Russian forces' actions as war crimes. With little sign of an end to the conflict, Western leaders could impose heavier sanctions against Russia at the NATO and G7 emergency summit later this week. The NATO will also likely decide to send more troops to the eastern border of the alliance. I expect leaders will agree to strengthen NATO's posture in all domains. With major increases to our forces in the eastern part of the alliance, on land, in the air, and at sea. The first step is the deployment of four new NATO battle groups in Bulgaria, Hungary, Romania and Slovakia. Russia, however, is not backing down easily. Russia supplies 40 percent of Europe's gas. So Putin's decision has sparked worries about an energy crunch, sending European energy futures to skyrocket. As the conflict continues, U.S. President Biden has decided to act on possible increase in sanctions visiting EU members in Europe to further discuss how to advance in the most effective manner. Four weeks into the war in Ukraine and NATO leaders are preparing for an emergency summit, with President Biden travelling to Europe on his first foreign tour since the war began. Leaders are expected to roll out additional sanctions against Russia as massive destruction and civilian deaths mount under continuous bombardment. Russia denies targeting civilians in what it calls a special operation. But in the besieged city of Mariupol, hundreds of thousands have been sheltering since the war's early days. While the city burns around them, people are trapped and left without food, water or heating. Bodies are being buried in the streets by residents themselves, such as Andrei. I hope there will be some sort of reburial, and this is just temporary. The military told us to put the bodies somewhere in the cold. The only cold places now are basements, but there are people in the basements. So bringing the dead to people is just... so we bury them here. Satellite imagery shows columns of smoke rising from residential apartment buildings engulfed in flames in the city that was once home to 400,000 people. No journalists have been able to report from inside the Ukrainian-held parts of Mariupol for more than a week. Yet, invading Russian troops appear to have stalled, taken heavy losses and have failed to capture a single major Ukrainian city or depose the government. On Wednesday, sources said a veteran senior aide of President Vladimir Putin resigned over the war and left the country with no intention to return. Anatoly Chubais is the first senior official to break with the Kremlin since the invasion. 
Ahead of this week's NATO summit, the EU's Ursula von der Leyen described Ukraine as the face of freedom. Honourable members, if freedom has a name, its name is Ukraine, and the Ukrainian flag is the flag of freedom today. In the past month, a quarter of the country's 44 million people have been driven from their homes. Meanwhile, Putin is also retaliating, stating that all gas payments by unfriendly countries will now have to be paid in rubles instead of the usual euros or dollars. The change is likely to affect the pressure on countries dependent on Russia for energy. Vladimir Putin said on Wednesday that Russia will seek payment in rubles for gas sales from so-called unfriendly countries. His comments sent European gas prices soaring on concerns the move would exacerbate the region's energy crunch. In the last few weeks, there were unlawful measures taken against Russia by a number of Western countries to freeze Russian assets. By doing this, the collective West has undermined the reliability of their currencies. Russian gas accounts for around 40 percent of Europe's total consumption. The possibility a change of currency could throw that trade into disarray. Putin said the government and central bank had one week to come up with a solution on how to move these operations into rubles and ordered gas giant Gazprom to make the corresponding changes to gas contracts. According to Gazprom, 58% of its sales of natural gas to Europe and other countries as of the 27th of January were settled in euros. US dollars accounted for about 39% of gross sales and sterling around 3%. The European Commission has said it plans to cut EU dependency on Russian gas by two-thirds this year and end its reliance on Russian supplies of the fuel well before 2030. But unlike the United States and Britain, EU states have not agreed to sanction Russia's energy sector. Russia's list of unfriendly countries corresponds to those that have imposed sanctions on it. The United States will once again waive tariffs for many Chinese goods. The Biden administration plans to reinstate expectations from Trump-era tariffs on about two-thirds of Chinese products that were previously granted waivers, most of which expired by the end of 2020. The Office of the United States Trade Representative said that the tariff exclusions for 352 types of Chinese products will be reinstated until the end of this year. But U.S. business leaders complained that the tariffs were hurting American companies too, putting them at a disadvantage. Responding to the outcries, President Biden decided to bring back exemptions for most Chinese products. 197 categories of goods still remain under stiff tariffs. The world's two largest economies have fought a trade war since 2018. The U.S. imposed tariffs on more than $300 billion in imports from China, ranging from footwear and clothing to electronics and bicycles and even pet food, after an investigation concluded China stole intellectual property from the American companies and forced them to transfer technology. Despite that, China continued to export a record amount of goods to the United States amid the pandemic. Crews were assessing the damage on the east side of New Orleans where a powerful tornado killed at least one person and injured eight others at the left or two-mile path of destroyed homes, uprooted power lines and also overturned vehicles. A powerful tornado left a two-mile path of destroyed homes, uprooted power lines and overturned vehicles on the east side of New Orleans. Crews were assessing the damage Wednesday after at least one person was killed and eight injured. A dark tunnel cloud touched down at around 7.30 p.m. Tuesday night, flattening buildings and flipping over vehicles in the Arabi area of St. Bernard Parish. National Weather Service meteorologists surveying the damage said on Wednesday that the tornado was at least an EF3 on the five-point enhanced Fujita scale, packing winds of 136 to 165 miles per hour. Much of southern Louisiana is still recovering from Hurricane Ida a fierce Category 4 storm last August that devastated rural communities to the south of New Orleans and killed more than 100 people in several U.S. states in the Caribbean. On Tuesday, the Biden administration said it was allocating more than $1.7 billion to Louisiana after the last two destructive hurricane seasons, local media reported. The same storm front that produced Tuesday's tornado brought heavy rains and winds to other parts of Louisiana and to Mississippi and Alabama. 
It came a day after twisters destroyed homes and injured people elsewhere in the region. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now on some updates on the COVID pandemic. Some welcome news for parents on COVID as Moderna says it's weeks away from asking the FDA to authorize emergency use for its vaccine for children six months and six years old, based on data showing it generated similar immune response to adults in its clinical trial. Moderna said on Wednesday it will ask regulators to approve its COVID-19 vaccine for children younger than six in what the drug maker and some parents of young children hope could be the first authorized shot for that age group in the United States. Data released by the drug maker showed the two-dose vaccine was about 38 percent effective in preventing infections in two to five-year-olds and 44 percent effective for children six months to two years old. Moderna said those figures were similar to the lower effectiveness against the Omicron variant seen in adults who had received two doses of its vaccine. Trial results for a rival shot made by Pfizer and BioNTech for two to four year olds showed a weaker immune response than in adults, forcing the trial to be extended to test a third dose. Results for that are expected in April. Moderna CEO said the company was working with the FDA and regulators globally to submit data as soon as possible. A top scientist at Moderna told that the company was a couple of weeks away from filing for authorization for the age group in the U.S., Europe and elsewhere. Shares of Moderna fell as much as 5% Wednesday morning, but paired some of those losses by midday. Along with this emergency use authorization was granted for Legevrio, making it the second oral pill to be approved in Korea. The decision comes as the authorities have determined that an alternative to Paxlovid is needed for high-risk patients. South Korea's Ministry of Food and Drug Safety on Wednesday approved the emergency use of the oral COVID-19 treatment, Legavrio, developed by U.S. drug maker MSD. Legavrio, also known as Molnupiravir, is now the second oral COVID-19 pill to be approved for use in the country, following the approval of Pfizer's Paxlovid in December last year. The drug has also been granted authorization in 15 countries, including the U.S., the U.K., and Japan. Those eligible for it are COVID-19 adult patients who are at relatively higher risk of developing severe symptoms. But the pill can only be given to those who cannot be prescribed with Paxlovid due to underlying illnesses related to the kidney or liver, and also to those unable to take Paxlovid with their other medications. People should also know that pregnant women and those under 18 are not included in the list. The drug ministry is advising women who are taking Legavrio to avoid trying to get pregnant for four days after the last dose and men three months. Four pills should be taken at once, twice a day with around 12 hours in between each intake. Like Paxlovid, the medicine should be taken for five days. Experts strongly advise patients to take it as soon as they experience symptoms. Clinical trial data show that the drug can reduce the hospitalization and death rate by around 30%. Some side effects of Legavrio include dizziness, diarrhea, and nausea, but experts say they appear to be very mild. Although it's a very small chance, authorities said that patients who have suffered serious side effects can be compensated if the causality between taking the pills and side effects is recognized. Meanwhile, health authorities earlier revealed that 20,000 courses of Legavrio will be introduced first, and they will be distributed to designated hospitals as soon as Saturday. The Taliban backtracked on their announcement that high schools would open for girls, saying that they would remain closed until a plan was drawn up in accordance with an Islamic law for them to reopen. 16-year-old Kadia stayed up all night, excited for her first day at school, after seven months at home in Afghanistan's capital, Kabul. But on Wednesday, she returned to her home in disappointment, after the Taliban suddenly ordered girls' high schools to stay shut. The school's assistant manager arrived and she was crying. She took the microphone and said that she can't speak. We were all surprised as to why she didn't want to speak on such a happy day and why she was in crying instead of welcoming us. Then she told us to leave the school because the officials haven't allowed girls to come to school. The Taliban postponed the reopening of schools for girls because of a technical issue and a lack of standardised uniforms for students around the country. 
That's according to Suhail Shaheen, a senior Taliban member based in Doha. Since the Taliban took over control in August, the international community has made the education of girls a key demand for any future recognition of their rule. A statement by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called the decision deeply damaging. The UN spokesperson on communications in Afghanistan, Stefan Dujaric, read his statement on Wednesday. The Secretary General says the denial of education not only violates the equal rights of women and girls to education, it also jeopardizes the country's future in view of the tremendous contributions by Afghan women and girls. Cardia says it's hard to keep motivated and overcome the disappointment. It was like a day of mourning and it was a very sad day. It was like losing a loved one. Everyone was crying. The girls were hugging and crying and saying goodbye. The last time the Taliban ruled Afghanistan from 1996 to 2001, they banned female education and most employment. Elon Musk was cheered as he oversaw the handover of Tesla's first German-made car as its Grunheit plant, marking the start of the U.S. automaker's inaugural European hub just two years after it was first announced. Elon Musk busted out his signature dance moves on Tuesday as Tesla officially opened its Gigafactory in Germany, the company's first manufacturing facility in Europe. I'm incredibly excited to uh, hand over the first production cars from our incredible team here at uh, Giga Berlin Brandenburg. Tesla will, will make sure that this is a, uh, a gem, uh, you know, a, a gemstone for the area, for Germany, for Europe and for the world. Musk toured the plant with Germany's chancellor, who hailed the Gigafactory as the future of the car industry. Auch diese Entscheidung. This decision to build a car factory in this country was the right decision and a sign of progress and the future of the auto industry. But not everyone thought it was the right decision. Environmental activists blocked the factory's entrance and displayed banners highlighting its high water use. Musk had hoped to open the factory eight months ago, but licensing delays and local concerns around the plant's environmental impact held up the process. Tesla got the final go-ahead on March 4th, providing the factory met conditions ranging from its water use to air pollution controls. Tesla had been forced to fulfill European orders from Shanghai while it awaited the German license, adding to rising logistics spending at a time when it was struggling with industry-wide supply chain issues. On Tuesday, shares of Tesla were up roughly 3% in midday trading. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Madeleine Albright, who fled the Nazis as a child in her native Czechoslovakia during the war, who then rose to become the first female U.S. Secretary of State, and in her late years, a pop culture feminist icon, died at the age of 84. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange married his long-term partner Stella Morris inside a British high-security prison at a small ceremony attended by just four guests, two official witnesses and two guards. Nestle said it will halt the sale of several non-essential products including KitKat and Nesquik in Russia in an unprecedented move amidst pressure on the world's top consumer goods company after criticism from Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. The UN World Food Programme has announced that it's going to extend its aid programme for North Korea until the end of next year to give the North more time to open its borders, closed since the start of the pandemic, which has prevented any aid deliveries. Recovery crews continued searching for a second black box from China Eastern Airlines. The passenger plane plunged into the mountains with 132 people on board as more information emerged about the pilots on the flight. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we air tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with a look at hundreds of Saudis dressed up in their favorite characters parading the Riyadh City Boulevard in a two-day costume event held as part of Riyadh season. Thank you for watching us again. Have a good night.